Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Game Changer. I am Maryam Zia. Tonight we will be exploring the ever evolving relationship between Pakistan and United States. Uh, Pakistan and US uh, share a complex history of relationship where there were times of close partnership between the two countries and then uh, there were uh, periods of uh, intense uh, disengagement and disagreements uh, between the two countries. Uh, recently, uh, President Joe Biden uh, sent a letter to Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif uh, which signals uh, a desire for renewed cooperation between both the countries. In today's program, uh, we will be exploring uh, these uh, ties and of course when we talk about uh, the cooperation between both the countries uh, of course uh, it has a security angle to it but how we can move beyond uh, the security lens uh, of uh, relationship between both the countries we will be exploring uh, in today's program one of the key sectors is of course energy uh, and climate change uh, but uh, at the same time uh, counter terrorism <coughs> efforts uh, remains uh, at the core of these relationship uh, with uh, uh, of course a new government in Pakistan and uh, looming elections in United States uh, what uh, the relationship is going to be looking like we will be exploring uh, in today's program and how both countries can revitalize uh, these uh, relationship and move their cooperation in multi sectoral uh, of course segments uh, to discuss this and more we are joined in the studios by former ambassador Nasser Ali Khan. Welcome to the program. We are also joined by Mr. Shehjar Khan, uh, who is commentator of Global Affairs. Welcome to the program. Uh, so, Ambassador Saab, uh, let me start with you. Uh, with the basic question, how do you view this, uh, of course, letter that was sent by President Joe Biden uh, to Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif? Because uh, we uh, we know that for the past two years there has been a cold uh, sort of uh, relationship between both the countries. Uh, do you uh, signify this as uh, a shift in uh, diplomatic ties between both the countries? What do you make of it? I wouldn't go as far as that, but you see. The uh, relationship uh, has been uh, rather uh, off and on and throughout our history we've mm -hmm. had a transactional relationship with the United States and ever since they left Afghanistan uh, recently uh, there has been a, a very reduced importance of Pakistan. This is something that I have heard from their former ambassador who had served here. Mm. So their priority has now shifted to the Asia-Pacific pivot. Mm. Indo-Pacific, that In is Indo -Pacific the policy that they're yes, calling. Where, where according to him, uh, that uh, pivot is from Wellington, which is New Zealand, to Waga, mm. which means our, um, uh, our country is not important in any respect and it's uh, almost irrelevant. However, uh, this letter is uh, definitely a positive uh, development. Uh, I think uh, it is a little uh, too late and too little in some sense hmm. uh, because you see this is an election year and uh, if you talk about uh, issues uh, such as uh, climate, you know, the Green Alliance and things like that, uh, at the end of this year probably you'll have another president who's not very fond of climate change. Uh, and the other problem I have with that uh, is you were mentioning energy. You see, we, we have a tremendous potential in Pakistan to mm. develop uh, green energy. Our hydroelectric potential, uh, our wind potential, our solar potential is one of the best in the world. But uh, having said that, we also have a huge uh, reserve of coal. Mm. And uh, now I realize that most of the Western countries uh, discourage Pakistan of course, from of course, developing from developing that particular potential. Right, now because it is, it is related to the fossil fuels and we more, um, want to move towards the greener technologies. We will be exploring that later in the program. But Ambassador Saab, I want to ask you about, of course, uh, the complex history of uh, ties between Pakistan and United States. Let's start with that. Of course, you also alluded to that uh, with the withdrawal of uh, US forces from Afghanistan, uh, the significance that Pakistan uh, has had in the past in US uh, 
foreign policy for that matter has somewhat reduced uh, but at the same time do you think that this gives another uh, sort of potential uh, to establishing a relationship where we are looking at pakistan us ties beyond that security lens and beyond uh, the third party uh, interventions like great power uh, or uh, from uh, the pakistan significance in afghanistan first tell us a little bit about how these uh, ties have uh, oscillated or fluctuated over so, the years uh, historically speaking it goes back to 1954 when we were when the united states was interested in uh, us joining a security alliance mm -hmm. in the region in fact before uh, partition even after the second world war uh, the united states was very wary of the soviet union and the spread of communist mm -hmm. uh, influence uh, down south so they created a whole range of countries all the way from egypt and algeria to indonesia a and their theory was that if we have a bulwark of islamic countries uh, communism is something that is an antithesis to islam and and to be able to strengthen these countries would be to the advantage of the united states so they decided early on to support the creation of pakistan also mm. then when we uh, came on, uh, we became a nation uh, then they very quickly formed an alliance with us because nehru and the leaders of india were also more left leaning in their opinion mm. uh, although they did have relations with them they favored pakistan and uh, from the 60s then uh, we got a lot of assistance not only military assistance for our defense but uh, for instance agriculture was transformed to an extent where they helped us in improving yields of wheat and cotton and right. especially the yield of cotton if you i don't know if you remember mexi park mm -hmm. wheat wheat was a special strain that was developed and it improved our food security mm -hmm. to a large extent apart from that they developed uh, helped us develop tarbela dam and mangla dam mm -hmm. now the amount of electricity we get from these two dams which costs next to nothing because we've long paid for the infrastructure cost is is very very uh, high and 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 it's uh, of very low cost so that has made a huge difference to pakistan mm. then we talk about the different uh, events in the region mm. where our relationship has mm. changed so i like to put it as three marriages and two divorces mm. and now we've had a recent separation mm. so the first marriage was with the yub khan the second one was in ziyas time mm. and the third one was post 911 mm. uh, the first two you know mm. many people have three said three phases of close yeah. relationship between both so the countries so even hillary clinton said that mm. we made a mistake that when the soviets mm. left afghanistan we just uh, left the area to its own devices mm -hmm. and that was very very harmful uh, not only to pakistan but for the whole region mm -hmm. you see okay. so these are the sort of historical <coughs> perspective but coming to now mm -hmm. i think the uh, we mustn't uh, have too many hopes right. with this overture i, I think it is uh, to a large extent uh, a formality but there's no doubt that they have an interest and there's no doubt in my mind that the united states is an extremely important country mm. because if you talk about today we have a, a huge export they of are course, the pa largest Pakistan, export market and not only that we have a surplus a trade surplus right. of about 6 billion dollars right you know our closest friend china we we have a, a deficit of about 10 billion dollars mm. with mm. them So this is something which is very very important. Right, there, there, there is a lot of potential when we talk about trade. Uh, but uh, Sharia, uh, when we uh, talk about Pakistan's relations uh, with the uh, United States, um, how do you see that this withdrawal uh, of the U.S. forces from Afghanistan impacted this bilateral ties? And also, uh, in the recent times, when we uh, when we look at the relationship, the Cold War kind of started, or the disagreement started with the Russian-Ukraine war as well, where Pakistan. maintained a stance of neutrality mm -hmm. and did not join any of the blocks uh, so uh, how, what do you make of this situation and uh, moving forward from that point in time so maryam if we view the pakistan us relationship um, historically uh, i think the us has always viewed pakistan i think like starting from 911 
the U.S. has viewed Pakistan from a security lens. Mm. So Pakistan has been the next n net security provider th to the U.S. when it comes to its security or foreign policy objectives in Afghanistan. Mm. So that is the view or the lens uh, with which this relationship has operated since 9-11. Mm. It's uh, interesting to see or it's, uh, I would say it's, uh, uh, it's going in the right direction that now that relationship However, the situation is right now. It's like moving more towards cooperation as well. It's moving towards uh, health security, <coughs> economic growth, access to education, as President Biden has also like said in his letter. Uh, when it comes to uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan was the country that facilitated the dialogue initially between the Taliban and the U.S. Mm. Uh, the way, uh, the haste in which the U.S. Le left uh, Afghanistan, that is not something that Pakistan was also advocating. Right. Pakistan was also wary that if there is a vacuum left in Afghanistan, that would go against Pakistan's interests as well. Right. But since this decision was taken initially in President uh, Trump's uh, administration and then carried forward by the Biden ad administration, the haste in which the U.S. left uh, Pakistan, we remember there were like some horrific visuals that of also course. like came out. There were also security lapses. Mm -hmm. ISK also attacked uh, and uh, at the airport. The vacuum that was created. And the vacuum that course. was created, that wasn't like good for the Biden administration. And I think there was this bitterness that developed after the evacuation of the U.S. Mm -hmm. forces from Afghanistan. Now there is a hope to revitalize mm -hmm. a relationship. So let's talk about some of the initiatives that both countries can cooperate uh, mm -hmm. on, uh, starting from uh, climate change. So, uh, mm -hmm. And how do you see the importance of Green Alliance framework between both the countries? So when it comes to the Green Alliance framework uh, or the cooperation uh, in climate mitigation, climate change, also energy, the Green Alliance basically covers all of these factors. Mm. So it focuses on agriculture, it uh, focuses on water management, and it also like focuses uh, mainly on the flood, flood recovery that Pakistan went through in 2022. And under this Green, green Alliance uh, framework, there are like a lot of like projects that Pakistan and the U.S. are already collaborating in. And that's, uh, if I just like talk about a few of them, there's like expansion of the Terbela and Mangla pro power project when it comes to uh, moving Pakistan towards renewable energy. So by 2030, the U.S. will support Pakistan in increasing Pakistan's reliance on renewables from 34% to 60%. Then there are like a lot of projects on ir irrigation, uh, climate risk uh, reduction, when it comes to expanding our uh, irrigation systems so it's like a whole range of projects that focus on all of these areas uh, and this is obviously the way to go um, when we increase our uh, agricultural productivity when we increase our uh, production the cost of energy in pakistan is the highest in the region mm -hmm. and we have to bring this energy uh, cost down if we want to export our uh, produce if we want to even get into production and increase our exports hmm. we need to have cheap uh, uh, electricity right, available but what is the level of cooperation uh, in uh, climate sector or climate change or environmental diplomacy at this point in time hmm. and what is the potential and what is the significance uh, since um, president biden also mentioned that of course this is one of the sectors in which both countries can uh, cooperate so, Mariam, when it comes to uh, the U.S. support to uh, mitigating uh, climate-related issues in Pakistan, uh, as you know, there is a green climate fund. Mm. And the U.S. has committed over a billion dollars when it comes million, to... Uh, yeah. 200 million, like they've also given to Pakistan in the flood recovery. Right, That's like separate. Right. So now, the onus is now on Pakistan, and I also advocate this on various forums as well, that right now, Pakistan, when it comes to the Ministry of Climate Change or climate mitigation, we don't have the specialists or experts mm -hmm. who have the capability to draw financial and uh, proposals to basically even apply for those projects. So we need a lot of like technical support. Mm -hmm. Uh, it could com become uh, coming from the World Bank, it could be coming from UN specialized agencies that focus on Green Climate Fund to access those funds. So now it's like up to Pakistan to access, uh, you know, all of these, uh, you know, uh, funds that are available. Pakistan is one of the countries which is the most vulnerable when it comes to uh, cli the effects of climate change. And we are the country who's like the least technically sound to even access those technologies and those funds. Mm. So there's a huge gap in terms of uh, what's available and what can be accessed. And even to access, Pakistan needs the climate uh, specialists that have the uh, prior experience. Mm. 
in dealing with these multilateral institutions. Right. So capacity building capacity in this building sector is, is also needed. required and we will be needing uh, US. And access to technology as well. Mm -hmm. That is like one area where we've like talked about in various programs that a lot of like uh, technology that is like needed is in the global north mm -hmm. and it's patented uh, technology. And if that technology has to be applied to global south, that's where the magnanimity of the West has mm -hmm. to come forward mm -hmm. that they would have to let go of these trademarks and profit making entities that would probably sell these technologies to the global south. The global south cannot like afford that of course, right of course. now. So right. access to those funds have to be in the form of grants rather than loans. Uh, which uh, the developing countries would want to avoid of because course. once they want to like uh, focus more towards economic development and that development should not be coming at the heels of like more loans that right. the Global South is of already course. indebted with. Of course and we keep on emphasizing that in our mm -hmm. shows regularly uh, but Ambassador Saab uh, coming back to the dimensions of uh, Pakistan US ties and uh, you earlier alluded to as well uh, the significance that Pakistan has had in the past might not be that much apparent in the current U.S. foreign policy. So, uh, do you think one of the reasons is maybe a shift in U.S. foreign policy from counter-terrorism to uh, the great power competition lens? And what implication does it have on Pakistan-U.S. ties? Of course, uh, when we talk about Indo-Pacific um, region, then Pakistan is not part of that uh, in, uh, of course, U.S. foreign policy. You see, the, there comes a point, as I said, most relationships are transactional. Mm. Why? Because we are not friends, we are not relatives. We, wherever our interests, mutual interests converge, there we will engage with one another. The other uh, problem, as far as we are concerned, is that in, in our country, one of the major uh, security risks is that with our neighbor towards our east mm -hmm. and the US policy for the last few years has actually shifted to have a strategic alliance with India mm -hmm. in order to be able to uh, counter the spread of Chi China, Chinese China, influence. Of so I have mentioned this before as far as India is concerned India will welcome all assistance and all foreign direct investments but India will never ever have a hot war with China. Right. You see, unless it's attacked itself by China, which is highly unlikely. Uh, China has a very large uh, I I I trade with India. And even though they had a lot of skirmishes on the north, mm. they continue to have the same trade. However, as far as Pakistan is concerned, uh, we are obviously uh, disappointed at this sort of situation developing. Right, but, but at the same time, uh, uh, Ambassador Sir, don't you think that uh, with Pakistan's close ties, ties with China, Pakistan still yes. remains significant because US wouldn't want uh, Pakistan to shift into another block. block. Of course, Pakistan is not uh, into block politics, but uh, don't you think it's still uh, significant for uh, US interest in the region? Well, there are some analysts that say that Pakistan could act as a bridge between the US and China. Mm, like 70s when Henry Kissinger but secretly no, I visited I personally, China. Hmm. these days, communications are very different. Hmm. And even secret communications are now changed due to technology. So I don't believe that to be the case. But right. uh, one of the uh, problems that the US has with Pakistan, and this is not speculation on my part, many people have stated it in the United States, that they are against the development of CPEC. Now, this is a major irritant because uh, the Chinese have a very close and comprehensive relationship with us. They have developed uh, a lot of infrastructure here, and we are hoping that more business will come to Pakistan. We don't want a major power hmm. to put hurdles in this path. Right, okay? right. And as far as the Chinese are concerned, they've told us time and again that they would welcome American investments in these special mm. economic zones or even in Gwadar. Right. So that is something which you know, comes again as, as an irritant between the two of us. Mm. However, we should focus on those things that are of our common interest. And in my opinion, uh, the biggest issue now, uh, which is increasingly becoming more important, 
is that of Afghanistan, of the Taliban, of the ISIS, Khorasan, because this is not something that will only impact uh, Pakistan, Pakistan or the region. Of course, it global will impact, security. Thing. Exactly. So, of course. But, so, but ambassadors, have, of course. So, so that ahead. is one of the reasons that at the moment the United States is watching the situation vis a vis the Taliban in Afghanistan. And uh, I think at the end of the day, any contacts they may have uh, quite, could quite easily be initiated from this side, mm -hmm. you see. Although right now we don't have a great relationship with the Afghan Taliban either. But we have a lot of commonalities with them and we have this common border with them. So at the end of the day, that is one of their concerns. Right. Apart from that, uh, Pakistan itself presents a market. We have a fairly large uh, middle class. Hmm. And so the companies in the United right, States right. are Right, right. We will interested. be talking about uh, the trade potential as well. Uh, but uh, Ambassador Saab, uh, how can we or Pakistan can ensure uh, that Pakistan's interests are represented uh, while engagement with U.S.? Well, any kind of negotiations you have, mm. they obviously have to, there has to be some give and take. Mm. Although there is an asymmetric relationship mm. because you're talking to a much bigger power and a much richer power. Mm. But nevertheless, we have been doing this for decades and we know how to do it. Mm. We try to spar with each other in some instances. Uh, the Americans think that sometimes we play a double game and sometimes we play the victim card. We go on this guilt trip and we keep telling them that every time you make use of us mm. and you throw us away, you know, this sort of thing. They, they understand all these things. But I think we are increasingly beginning to understand each other's priorities and interests. And that's what we need to play upon. Right. And pa how can Pakistan address this deep-rooted uh, misinterest uh, between both the relations and also uh, the structural uh, issues when we talk about uh, uh, Pakistan-US ties? Yes, because you see, when you, when you have a mistrust, mm. which has been around for, for at least the last uh, 20 years, mm. Uh, then the only way uh, is to engage more and more and to have transparency in your relationships. Uh, I mean, to give you an example, uh, in our relationship with Iran, for instance, something that I am very worried about. I, I think it's the most unfortunate thing uh, and that we need to sit down and talk to them and ask them what is that exactly it is that pushes them to the level that they can cross our border. Mm. And now instead of escalating the issue, we need to have talks and, and show them a genuine understanding of their problem and then actually do something about it. Mm. You see, the, the Americans understand us quite well by now and we understand them reasonably well. So we know up to what point we can go and we know how far this, uh, this is a give and take. And we know exactly what they want when they come here. Mm. So we have to work within that thing. And this is not just true of this relationship. Mm. It's true of any, any bilateral engagement. Right. But you know, the United States uh, is a major power in the world. Of course. And it's a major economic powerhouse. And they import a lot of goods and services. And in the future, again, I'm coming to trade, hmm. but you know, these are things that make a lot of difference. When you don't have political issues, hmm. it's economic diplomacy that comes into play. Of course, of course. Uh, Shriyar, but uh, when we uh, talk about Pakistan's ties uh, with the US, uh, how do you think that uh, both countries can strengthen uh, their relationship uh, from the lens of countering uh, violent ex extremism? And of course, uh, in collaboration, uh, both countries can fight, of course, like you earlier alluded to as well, uh, uh, the rise in um, extremist attacks, terrorist attacks, and uh, that presents a global security threat, not only a threat to Pakistan and the region. So, uh, Mariam, uh, President Biden's letter uh, alludes to this uh, same statement that you're talking about, that the U.S. wants to support Pakistan in overcoming its regional as well as global challenges. Regional challenges right now for Pakistan, um, I see is the terrorism or the threat of terrorism that is emanating from Afghanistan. Mm. And 
we have like talked about various UN reports, very substantial UN reports that have come out, and they basically indicate towards an alliance of a lot of like cross-border terrorist organizations that are now cooperating with TTP, providing them with like material support, financial support, and uh, support in terms of uh, ideology and uh, finances as well. So this is one issue that has a potential to basically spill over from Afghanistan into the regional countries and then globally as well. And now we've seen this. This has recently happened. Uh, the recent uh, terrorist attack in Moscow has been traced back to ISKP, which originated this <coughs> attack from within the geographical confines of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And we can already see that this whole issue of Daesh, ISKP, is now becoming a global uh, issue. Yesterday or the last week, they basically attacked Moscow. Previously, Pakistan and uh, uh, Iran came to a brink of war because of mm. the attacks that were again emanating through Tajik nationals from Afghanistan's soil. And this has a uh, potential to spill over in Europe as well. Yeah. Europe is a hotbed because of the uh, very uh, sensitive situation that is developing in the Middle East. There is a lot of radicalization and extremism emanating in European capitals mm. as well. And all of these sentiments are being uh, used by these cross-border uh, terrorist organizations in Afghanistan and they're capitalizing on it to recruit more people to conduct terrorist organizations in Western capitals. Mm. So this issue initially, which <coughs> seemed like a cross-border issue between TTP and Pakistan, is now becoming a global issue. Right. Al-Qaeda is back into the whole foray. Mm. ISKP is a major of threat. Of course, and Pakistan, uh, of course, keep on enforcing that um, uh, right uh, on different yeah. forums as well. It when seems we talk about, of initially that the West mm. was basically looking at it as Pakistan's mm. internal issue. Mm. The US and the Western allies were more focused on ISKP and Al-Qaeda. Mm. When it came to TTP, they basically said like it's an issue Pakistan's between... Pakistan's internal problem. Of Afghanistan course, and Pakistan, they should resolve yes. it. Mm. And this is the issue with all... Uh, security related uh, dilemmas that the world faces that it small uh, starts off something small but then it evolves into a global threat mm. and this mm. happened in 9-11 as well mm. and we don't want history to be repeating itself mm. so yes Pakistan and the US and the Western al alliances or cooperation has historically been viewed uh, from a CT or a security lens it has evolved into more economic uh, uh, integration into economic cooperation as well. But unfortunately, the geographical location where, where mm -hmm. we are, mm -hmm. security will always be a big issue unless or until the geographical boundaries of Afghanistan are secure and stable. Right, and at, at the same time, of course, uh, these uh, the regional economic integration, um, of course, projects like CPAC and others uh, play uh, a pivotal role. Uh, but like earlier you were talking about a uh, trade potential between both the countries, um, how do you see that uh, US and Pakistan collaborating in uh, in Pakistan and of course Pakistan's evolving uh, consumer market, uh, what potential does it exist for uh, US uh, companies to invest in Pakistan? Uh, before I answer that question, I'd just like to mention that from a security point of view, we also need to discuss the issues in Balochistan mm. because we have ample proof that India is playing a part in inciting insurgency over there and funding it. So that is something that we need to discuss with the Americans as well because this is something, again, going back to Afghanistan. Mm. But your question was regarding the trade potential between the two countries. You see, where does trade come from? It comes basically from a large population mm. which is involved in production of goods and services. Mm. And some of those services, it has an inherent advantage in producing. So someone else wants to buy it. And, and, and so in Pakistan's case, the first thing, the first advantage is that we have a huge population, 240 million people, uh, out of which there is this large youth bulge which means you know when you consider populations of europe and even countries like japan these are depleting uh, populations and aging populations so in the next few decades 
the West has to realize mm. that we need labor mm. and trained manpower. And this will come from countries like Pakistan. Mm. So to be able to collaborate mm. in training the right sort of people mm. that you can forecast would be required. Right. And uh, what, what kind of uh, collaboration is required to make uh, from US to make Pakistan uh, a competitive and attractive market for mm. these uh, companies to come and actually invest uh, in Pakistan? The first, the first thing is that you identify those jobs that may be required in the future. Mm. Because with artificial intelligence and automation, a lot of jobs uh, are, are getting disrupted. Mm. You and may not obsolete need. obsolete for yes, that matter. Obsolete perhaps. But you see, uh, to give you an example, uh, people in Norway who are very well off, uh, 20 years from now, the overwhelming majority of them will be over 80 years old. Right. And that's the time they will need caregivers, mm. they'll need companions, mm. they'll need people who will help them in their old age. Mm. That's just an example. But in order to supply that manpower, you cannot simply send people there. Right. You need workers, to train them to their standards, right. their standards of cleanliness, their standards of punctuality, their standards of education. And this happens in all such labor markets. For example, in the Middle East, there was a time maybe five decades ago, you saw a lot of Pakistani laborers. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about people who are digging trenches on, on the roadside, but all kinds of domestic workers, drivers, operators of equipment and all that. Slowly, it has been replaced in the domestic side by Filipinos. Mm. Why? Because the Filipinos, the Philippine government has done this in a formal, organized manner. Mm. They train their people to be domestic workers and they don't only train them in the physical work, mm. but the psychological impact going to a new country might right. have uh, to understand the culture of the people mm. that you're going to, their religion, all this training, so they provide a superior level right. uh, of, of labor. Mm. Similarly, if you're working on a golf course, not anybody can go and become mm. a starter or a caddy or a trainer or mm. whatever. So first you have to identify jobs that will be required in Europe and North America. Right. And then from now on, you have to train them. Now that's where these countries who are actually interested in inviting that labor or to come and help us in that training of those people. Apart from that, as I mentioned, American companies, American companies will see an advantage in the 20 million or so Pakistanis that can afford to travel, go to expensive mm. restaurants, right. buy expensive clothes, Hmm. So this is a huge market that they would be salivating at. Right. And, and of course, there's a lot of potential as well. But at the same time, um, uh, Shiryar, when we talk about Pakistan's uh, trade relations, there are a lot of challenges and hurdles <coughs> as well. Uh, what needs to be done, in your opinion, to address uh, those obstacles and agreements like uh, U.S.-Pakistan trade and investment framework agreement? What role uh, can or could this play uh, so in that regard? So, Mariam, there are like a lot of frameworks a lot of like MOUs, a lot of like discussions that happen not just with the US, with like various different countries. Right. When it comes to Pakistan, I've always observed that Pakistan is a very over-regulated economy. Mm. And the problem with over-regulated economy is that, and you know, protectionist, protectionist. We have the yeah. kind of because like historically, Pakistan has gone through a lot of economic models. Mm. We have uh, tried the neoliberal economic model, we have tried Keynesian economic model, we have like tried protectionist models as well. And now we're the, with the IMF program, we're like again moving towards a more market-based free, free market uh, eco economic model. The only thing that we haven't like really focused on is on, on increasing our productivity mm -hmm. and increasing the capacity of our human resources. When we have a country whose population is like around 240 million people, 60% of them are under the age of 30, are th the youth of Pakistan, are they technically capable and sound to be uh, playing their part, a positive part in the global uh, labor market? Right. So what are the needs, If, as Ambassador Saab was saying, that have we conducted a needs assessment of mm -hmm. the international market and have we uh, provided a product 
services or human resources right. in pakistan's so economy are the issues that we mm. need to address at home but mm. when we uh, talk largely about pakistan us trade ties what mm. are the challenges and what needs to be done uh, to address uh, those keeping in mind uh, the recent desire mm. on both ends to you know revitalize kind of relationship so there are three main areas where mm. we definitely need to work a lot one is to attract foreign direct investment in the form of us companies to come and uh, uh, you know make investments in pakistani economy that's number one second is the other way in which we have to like pro produce products we already uh, export a lot of textile to the us market they gave us uh, access and that's like why you know uh, we get a preferential uh, access to the us market in terms mm -hmm. of textiles are there any other areas in which pakistan can basically provide those services i think it is one area where there is a huge potential that is not not being realized right now everything mm -hmm. that is being done right now is informal in nature and informal companies are again very youth led mm -hmm. and they are having a lot of issues when it comes to handling their finances mm -hmm. attracting Start investments startups uh, yes, well so that's like one potential. area that uh, needs a lot of like uh, support the third is the economic cooperation that us and pakistan has and that there's like the green alliance uh, movement there are a lot of like projects when it comes to us aid which basically helps pakistan in attracting investment mm -hmm. in developing frameworks and policies and deregulating a lot of like uh, uh, sectors where we can attract investment and board of investment uh, plays a very key role in basically doing that ease of doing business comes into play uh, uh pakistan's special economic zones under the whole cpec framework mm. which are providing uh, you know uh, incentives to international organizations to come and set up their businesses in pakistan right. so these are like three main areas broadly where a lot of like cooperation can happen between right right uh, the and US also and pakistan. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about uh, the potential for cooperation in other sectors like education mm -hmm. health is an important uh, sector in which both countries mm -hmm. can cooperate so health security mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to education support the us and pakistan have historically had like a lot of like linkages if you look at the uh, programs through usa and united states education uh, foundation the fulbright scholarship program there like a lot of like fellowship programs a lot of like exchange programs in various universities of pakistan that take pakistani students even in undergraduate levels for exchange and uh, trainings to the us so there is like a lot of like cooperation already happening what we need to do more is to educate the pakistani uh, students into uh, accessing us universities and when it comes to standardized tests i see a lot of like students in pakistan who are not like really trained to take exams like the sats the gmats the gres when it comes to toefl examination to access those scholarships and those funds that are available to the us uh, market in the us uh, uh, universities and a lot of like students kind of like lose out on those opportunities mm. yes there is like a lot of cooperation between hcc and the us right. state department that is happening mm -hmm. but there's like a lot more that can be done education is like one area where pakistan should increase its focus they should also increase the amount of G gdp that we are spending i think it's the lowest in the region as well so those are like areas in which the us is already supporting but the, that support and that cooperation can increase many folds mm. and this is like one way of like getting the technically sound and trained resource from the us and even we can like send labor which is like technically sound right historically we have been like sending laborers the us is one market in which pakistan has sent engineers <laughs> it experts and doctors so over there pakistan resources like very respected mm -hmm. and that is like some area where a lot of like uh, cooperation can be expanded right of course there is a lot of potential uh, but lastly ambassador sahab how can pakistan and us learn from their past mistakes and uh, maybe shape the contours of a right sized uh, relationship between both the countries you see there have been several attempts in having a long term and deeper relationship but then due to regional issues it goes back to a transactional one but uh, whenever i talk about such relationships i like to look for areas which are win win situations mm -hmm. now again coming back to these are areas where the government should have minimum interference mm -hmm. uh, the it industry has grown here from 4 million uh, fr sorry from about 10 million uh, to about 4 billion dollars a year now a large portion of this is because there are indian and pakistanis 
IT uh, businessmen in the United States that find our uh, services uh, better value for money. You see, the Indian rupee is more than three times the value of ours. So it's a little difficult to compete uh, with us in that respect. But that's not all. The point I'm trying to make is allow the private sector, allow it without any kind of restrictions. Give them a 10-year tax holiday, make it extremely easy because you see, IT is something where you are not taking physical goods across the border or through a port, right. uh, you have an earthquake or, or you have some terrorist act or you have a shortage of energy. I can be sitting in a small office with 30 people and making a good income right. uh, and it's a win-win situation. Uh, then there are those kinds of investments let's say in energy for instance where the American companies which by the way already 80 American companies are operating in Pakistan. So there are other opportunities here in mining in corporate agriculture where Amer American companies would be interested and one of the reasons for that is that a lot of their own markets are saturated. They're looking for opportunities of abroad because they have the manpower, the technical expertise, they have the financial, uh, ex uh, financial strength to do this. But their issues are that of insecurity, instability and things like that. That's the only time that I would like the government of the United States to step in and help. Right. Because if I'm an American investor, and I want to invest in a country like Pakistan, and I have certain fears about political risk mm -hmm. or country risk, then the government should say, we have a fund mm -hmm. like OPIC. They have right. OPIC, a special insurance for, that protects the equity of the uh, investor. Mm -hmm. And to create that conducive environment for yes. the investments to Apart come from that, I think the government should be having minimal say, minimal interference. And I need to mention the SIFC. This is of doing course. a good job and it has people right at the top which ha take a personal interest in it and their aim is to truly provide a one window uh, operation for, for investors. Of course, of course. So mm -hmm. there is a lot of potential. Thank you very much, uh, former Ambassador Nasir Ali Khan, for joining us in today's program. Thank you very much, Mr. Shayar Khan, for joining us in today's program. Of course, uh, when we talk about Pakistan's relations uh, with uh, United States, uh, historically both countries had uh, many stressors uh, in the past, but it is uh, in both countries' interest. Uh, to learn uh, from uh, the mistakes and cooperate in other sectors, um, uh, including security, climate change, uh, and of course, uh, multi sectors. There's a lot of potential. That's all from Game Changer tonight. Take care. Allah Hafiz.